Big thank you to T20 and ORF for putting this together and for the last eight months, very productive eight months. And of course, I'd also like to thank um, all the authors of the policy briefs who have actually provided inputs to put this document together. I know most of them are not here, but a big thank you to them as well. Um, as we release this task force communique on macroeconomics, trade and livelihoods, policy coherence and international coordination, I think it's important to acknowledge that this task force uh, has produced this communique at a period when there has been immense global economic uncertainty. And it's worth reflecting on how things have evolved over the course of the last eight months, because that has shaped the conversations in our group. Now, the IMF tells us, the recently released World Economic Outlook, that you know, global economy is gradually recovering from the pandemic and from the geopolitical crisis. Uh, they have revised global growth forecast upwards from 2.8% to 3%. Um, nevertheless, the document does say that we are not out of the woods yet. Um, rising interest rates in response to inflation uh, weigh down economic activity. Uh, global headline inflation is expected to decline sharply by two percentage points, but core inflation continues to remain high. It, 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 it expects that it's going to decline far more gradually, and in fact, in 2024, they have revised their projections upwards. Uh, now, in this present environment of low growth, inflation, and rising interest rates in mature economies, this entire environment poses a very complex set of challenges for the global economy as a whole, but for developing and emerging markets in particular, because macro policies in advanced economies have spillover effects on emerging and developing markets uh, specifically. Um, what makes matters worse is also the fact that prospects for trade growth are quite bleak. Uh, the WTO tells us that trade growth is expected to slow down to 1.7% in 2023. The pace of trade growth is going to be subpar, again, on account of geopolitical uncertainties, increasing interest rates, uh, tighter monetary policy. And put together, you know, the bleak prospects of growth, uh, the weak historic, the weak growth, uh, combined with bleak prospects for trade growth, have implications for employment creation and livelihoods. Now, in this backdrop, for the benefit of those who were not a part of the task force, the work in this task force was divided into three streams. Uh, the first work stream was monetary synchronization in fiscal space. The second was trade, investment, and supply chain resilience. And the third was employment and livelihoods. And what we did through the course of our work uh, over the last eight months was that in our deliberations, we not only focused on each of these work teams separately, but how they connect together. So for example, we didn't look at just coordination uh, between monetary and fiscal policy within G20 countries, but also how we can have better coherence between monetary and fiscal policies and trade and investment policies. And then how can these together revive growth? Growth that is not just inclusive and sustainable, but also job rich and create jobs for women and youth. Uh, so in this backdrop, let me start by posing my first question um, to Dr. Kim, which is on our first work stream of monetary synchronization and fiscal space. Uh, Dr. Kim, we'd like to get your thoughts on how do you think we can promote better coordination within G20 member countries on monetary and fiscal uh, policy, uh, in particular given that central bankers in advanced countries have shown limited interest in any sort of coordination mechanism. So what can the G20 actually do effectively so that macro policies in advanced countries in the global north have least disruptive effects or spillovers on emerging and developing markets in the global south more generally? Uh, thank you very much, moderator. Uh, and first of all, I'd like to thank the, uh, uh, for having me uh, in this very uh, informative and uh, insightful uh, meetings here. And I am very happy and honored uh, to uh, join the, uh, the task force one. And uh, during the, uh, the eight uh, months of the, our work, uh, it was really I mean, interesting and, 
uh, uh, stimulating, I mean, to talk about yeah, the many uh, macroeconomic and trade issues uh, together with the other colleague. And uh, you talk about the, uh, the, the macroeconomic stabilization and the harmonization, so, and uh, how to do that. And you already mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, the difficulties of the harmonization. Uh, but I'd like to uh, talk about uh, something about the information sharing and then a precise prescription uh, to the current situation, uh, including early warning system and also revolutionary technology pro progress and, is, and its expansion uh, to the daily life of people are needed. Uh, let me explain uh, some more uh, in detail. Uh, as the pandemic hit the, the world economy uh, from the demand and supply side together uh, simultaneously, and the world is now uh, getting weaker uh, against uh, any aftershocks. So higher volatility in demand for a certain durables, for instance, uh, resulted in after the pandemic. And so economic cycle uh, country by country, it uh, became more synchronized. So, so this is act actually the, 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 the worst uh, condition uh, for the world economy. So in order to smooth out the demand for goods intertemporally, uh, we need to harmonize the macroeconomic policies of each country. So sometimes, I mean, synchronization of macro uh, policy together with supply side the shocks from the technology revolution uh, are required. So uh, uh, that's what I'm saying, but um, it's really difficult I mean, to uh, harmonize the macroeconomic policy because I mean, the prerequisition of the, uh, the, this uh, harmonization is uh, information sharing, uh, which uh, as, uh, as some countries uh, uh, are really willing to I mean, provide the information of the, uh, the each uh, the countries. But um, uh, in many cases, because of the stigma impact, uh, many countries uh, are quite difficult, uh, find difficult to, to uh, for the, the information sharing. So in order to do that, I think that the multilateral uh, institutions, uh, the, the role of uh, these institutions uh, need to be strengthened and also very uh, high, should be highlighted. And so information sharing first. Uh, second, the pre pre price, pre price, uh, precise uh, prescription uh, to the current situation and also uh, produce the, uh, the, the proper method uh, such as the, the early warning system that the, our the task force one, uh, the recommendation of the task force one. And also, uh, we need to talk about the, the supply shock, the uh, positive shock, what I mean, is the uh, revolutionary technology progress. And then it's very, very, very uh, rapid and expansion to the uh, people's and daily life. It's, uh, it's, it's very important uh, to smooth out the, the, all these kind of shocks, I mean, uh, intertemporally. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so if I can move to you, Vera, now to our second work stream, which was on trade. Uh, what role do you think the G20 can play there to boost not just trade, but also investment flows and enhance supply chain resilience in the backdrop of trends of rising protectionism and a return to industrial policy that we've seen in a post-COVID yes. era? Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. And let me tell you just that I just arrived from a big, big conference on the, the Society of International Economic Law. That is the place where all the big, uh, the big persons discuss uh, trade investment and, and uh, certainly uh, environment. And well, I, I don't uh, have good news for you. Because, well, we, we, we built a system of uh, trade for more than 60 years. And now, guess what's going on? First, a big uh, uh, lesson is that trade was transformed in security issues. Nobody talks anymore about anti-dumping tariff and all these the, things. Everybody's talking about Article 21. Do you know what the GATT 21 article is? You know about 20, that is, and with, for environment, we can do anything. 21 is about war, it's about special uh, security issues. And remember what happened. Many years, some years ago, Mr. Trump decided to use this article to say no more steel and aluminum because we are going to raise tariff. And then what happened, a war of steel with the European Union and automobiles and so on. And after this issue, there's a, a sub uh, examples how uh, security is becoming the main issue of trade. Because for security issue, you can do anything. Uh, we have problems with Ukraine and Russia uh, after the, the Crimea war and so on. This is the first big point. 
The second, and perhaps the most interesting for us, is about what we call the neo industrial policy. Do you know what's this? I was a professor of economics for a long time. I started my life talking about prebish, you know, states, subsidies, and so on. Now, and then I learned you have to be a liberal, now liberal one. So it's that. Neoliberalism is that. Now you have the new industrial policy that is about state, a huge amount of subsidies, a war of subsidies, and things, do what you want, want to, 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 to make the, 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 uh, the sectors you want to. And this is about resilience. It's, we talk about the coupling. Now we are talking about the risky, funny thing, and French shore and also, and so let's see what's going to happen with uh, the, new, the new value chains, the regional trains. The third main issue that we talk about, a lot about, is the famous critical materials. Look, everything used, computers, nice uh, vehicles and all. But we talk, first we decide, we discuss that, where are these minerals? Now we discuss who is going to process them. And this is the first cynicism of our life now, that is, the, the Europeans and Americans, yes, you are going to use electrical vehicles. Go to the numbers, go to the papers, and try to, to see how many tons of minerals do you need for each car, two tons, for eolic, uh, uh, 100 tons. And look what's going on. There is no such an amount of minerals available now. Probably they are going to discover them. But the big problem is there's just one country, just one country processing minerals because of the amount of energy they use and because the amount of residuals. Do you know that 90% of residuals you, that you need to, to, to eject, to do something with them, to get what you need for your car. So what I said is, is a big cynicism of the rich countries say, I'm going to use electrical car and guess where the, these minerals came from and who is going to process them. And tell me what we are going to do with the rejects. Now the, 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 the four points, and this is the point for me that's most important. Remember, in the first meeting of this G20, I start discussing with you the main issues that is, uh, okay, environment is important. No question about this. We have to do something. Now, what's, uh, what's happened? WHO starts to uh, uh, constructing a, a, a huge uh, data bank on the trade measures related to environment, that we call TRAMS. And remember, the, in the first meeting, I talk about 14. Thousand. Then the second meeting, I talk about 15. Now I can talk about 17. The funny thing is half of this amount, the, the total the secretariat discovered and listed, it is on the database, but the, the, the countries only notify half. Tell me why. Why, why, why countries are hidden this kind of uh, information for us? What kind of uh, rules, new measures of, uh, of environment they are going to use against us? The second, and th this is, when you talk about trends, you are talking about TBT, the technical budget to trade, it's a big gut issue, and we have to, to, you have the big institutions of ISO, followed by the European Union, and the United States hates ISO, and use 300 uh, standardizing bodies. So, put this aside. Now move to the second big system that is to measure what is called the private sectors. A private sectors, the big uh, uh, non-government organizations, uh, they are helping us to really to produce green uh, products. The basis of these are completely different from the regulatory issues of ISO and standardizing body, completely different. Uh, and we use this mainly for organic food and all this kind of thing. And they are using for, for uh, industrial products. And the funny thing is that, this is the most interesting issue, the way you measure the emission of carbon in the steel for steel in the United States is not accepted in Europe. The famous carbon club created by G7 Gets, not, gets a new result because the big countries cannot accept the same standards 
of one of the other. Come on, what are you talking about? This is the, 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 the second week system. Now go to the, the new, what's the new word of the, that we talked a lot about yesterday and today? ESG, so nice. So what e ESGs, we have the Fig, Mr. Fink uh, interview in uh, Economist last week. So marvelous, everybody is uh, uh, using this. What is this? Is the way that accountants and auditors uh, measure risk, measure value, value, money, money. The value that you are going to, to, to put some risk and then do you have the money to pay for the risk or that you are polluting? That's what they want. Tell me, how many standards there are already created by accountants and auditors? 600. Now, and now finally, last two weeks, two weeks ago, the Institute of uh, Standardized uh, uh, Accounting Group or Finance Group, the Finance Report, decided to, to release the, two, the first two standards of ESGs to put an order on the system. So you have three systems that are not talking to each other and you decided to, to, be, to, uh, to, to decide what is green or not and reject to import your pro products from developing countries. And more important than this, and I will finish with this, is that there is a huge divide. Do you know why? Because who is developing all these standards? Rich countries from a temperate zone Please go to the, your map, Munda, Mapa Mundi, and take a look. You have all countries, the majority of countries in the north of the equator. You have, it's funny, it's, uh, you have Brazil and Argentina, and you have one third of Africa and uh, Australia and so on. You have India in the north of tropical country. But then all this kind of things that I'm talking about, standards, 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 were developed by rich countries and temperate zones. And guess the big conclusion that people are discovering and proving that they are not fit for tropical countries. And uh, to finish, I will give you some nice examples. A little cow in Brazil walk on the fields, they, they eat on the field, the manure is used to fertilize the field. The same cow in Switzerland it's going in the barn, stay there, a heating one uses energy. And then they eat uh, soya beans that came from Brazil by ship. Fantastic, the amount of pollution. This is not the same. As I told you, the way, and I agree with uh, what, uh, what was uh, talked in the last panel, we need to change not only the way we measure things, the way we are uh, uh, evaluating things, and to put things in a more balanced way. This fight of uh, uh, temperate and tropical uh, zones are really important. Let me give you another example. Do you know what's going on in Atacama Desert? The desert of Atacama is in, Ch in Chile. Go to your Google and discover 78 billion tons of closes, used closes. Closes are there in the air because it's dry. They are there. Who and Chile is buying this, receiving money, not buying, is receiving money to, to stock these old uh, closes. And do you know what they discover? That half of these closes are new, completely new, unused, but are thrown there because of the next season of the fashion, the lovely uh, uh, European fashion houses, they have to come with new items. So the question for every one of you, how many clothes you buy by year and what are you doing with your clothes? So this kind of way to see the issue of trade is a more, for me, is more important uh, point. And the, 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 the last word is this. We are now, we need now to have a, what I call a diplomacy of standards. With this war of standards, you are not going anywhere because this is a big fight of the North colonizing the South again. Thank you. So that was a very powerful assertion of all the problems, Vera. But can I ask you in one minute, 
uh, to sort of say that this issue of standards, which is a critical problem, how can the G20 take a stab at fixing it? This is the place to do. First, recognize that you have a problem. And more important than this, you have the, the legal basis in the Agenda 21. It is there. Article 7, Article 11, that you have to be differentiate your uh, criteria, can't develop developing countries, and more, that you have to, to treat tropical countries in the different way of the temperate one. It is there, it is the legal basis there. So a huge work for the G20 to, to, to start to doing something. All right, so then taking the issue of trade forward and linking it with employment. Uh, and Dr. Damuri, I'd like to turn to you here. Um, you know, the, the return of protectionism, the, the rise of industrial policy once again, uh, and the implications it has for trade flows hurts prospects of employment generation in developing countries. How do you look at this interrelationship between trade and employment generation, particularly through the lens of SMEs? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, I, I think uh, uh, Farah already uh, lay out the current situations and how worrying actually uh, that that kind of uh, uh, current prog uh, current developments uh, on uh, on trade uh, and uh, i have to uh, stress first on that uh, although we um, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, weakness uh, or, and disadvantage on trade uh, activities. International trade activities actually already contribute a lot to the employment creation, especially in the developing countries. Uh, the, the emergence of uh, a global value chain, for example, uh, in the last 40, 50 years has provided not only uh, more jobs, but also more quality jobs. Uh, to the uh, people in developing countries. But the current situations actually with uh, all the, the rise of industrial policy, protectionism uh, uh, seems uh, to make the, uh, the uh, futures a uh, little bit bleak uh, on the uh, employment creations because now the, uh, the res resilience instead of e economic interdependence becomes, becomes uh, the mantra uh, of uh, international trade policy. Um, but rather than improving resilience, but the current protection his policy actually increased the uncertainty, the policy uncertainty and also business uncertainty. Uh, that's why uh, I think the, uh, this would hurt the employment creations. Uh, for example, uh, you can see that uh, the resorting part or the, or the um, uh, how the, the developed uh, uh, business from developed countries are, are encouraged uh, to uh, come come back uh, to their ho uh, home countries uh, and then perhaps leaving uh, and staying away from the uh, developing nations. Uh, it's also um, the, it, uh, the, the, the current uh, technology also tends to be more capital intensive. The current technology for production is more capital intensive and uh, demand less workers. Uh, that kind of things would uh, be uh, detrimental so for the employment cre uh, creations, uh, especially in the developing nations. Uh, and it adds up the complexity, uh, what uh, what already happens during the, the pandemic uh, era where the supply chain was disrupted very heavily and uh, it didn't really come back uh, in the uh, for, uh, I took uh, I'm taking a examples uh, of Indonesia uh, in Indonesia uh, currently we are still um, um, the, the, uh, there are still uh, around 4 million uh, people who uh, previously work in the formal sectors, no longer work in the formal sectors. E even the growth already there, the, 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 uh, the recovery is already there. So uh, that kind of the, the prospects of the quality job uh, and employment is very, very uh, uh, a very uh, 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 uncertain at the moment. The, on uh, the SME, you mentioned about the SME participation. 
participations is always low uh, in the global value chains. Uh, and that with current situations, with protectionisms uh, and more industrial policy, it's, for, it's getting harder for SME uh, to participate uh, in the international trade activities. Uh, like a global trade alert uh, a platforms recording the, uh, tracking the um, protectionist policy recorded like 2,500 protectionist measures in 2022 alone. Uh, so the, these SMEs would uh, face a very uh, uncertain situations when they're trying to uh, go uh, internationally. And I think G20 would, uh, would can play uh, critical roles uh, in, uh, in supporting uh, the uh, participations of uh, SMEs in the international trade. Yeah. So again, very quickly, in just one minute, I mean, what is the role that the G20 can, what concrete steps be in terms of access to information, markets? I mean, what can the G20 do there? Yeah, I, I think G20 first uh, can uh, uh, raise the awareness that the current situation, instead of improving the resilience, trade uh, and economic resilience uh, and, uh, and security and stability, it uh, it even detriment, uh, detrimental to the uh, uh, global uh, uh, economy. It um, uh, it uh, uh, increase uncertainty uh, in, and it discourage uh, business to expand uh, their uh, their activities. Uh, and on SME, actually, one thing that uh, uh, the uh, G20 can start uh, is actually to uh, try to uh, measure the participations of SMEs in the GVC. Uh, we all, all already talk about the participations of uh, uh, SMEs uh, in, G in GVC for quite a while, but we never really know. And what kind of indicator that we can use uh, to uh, to measure uh, the progress or the uh, or the declines in this participation? Uh, I think G20 can uh, start from that. I think that's an absolutely valid point because as a starting point for the conversation. We need to have that data, that information, and SMEs are also defined differently across the entire G20 horizon. And additionally, most of them are in the informal sector in developing economies. So getting a right measure and then tracking progress on that is, of course, a challenge. But that's a conversation where, where you know, that's the G20 is perhaps the right forum to start having that conversation. Uh, turning now to you, Dr. Latif, you were not a part of this task force, but what I wanted to get your thoughts on was on the issue of employment creation. One of the subjects that we delved into in greater detail on the subject of employment and livelihoods was bringing women back into the workforce. Now, of course, the issue of women-led development has been uh, one of the key themes that India's G20 presidency has focused on. And what our task force highlighted was that it was important to bring women back into the workforce, into gainful economic activity, not just because it's a moral and social imperative, but because it is an economic imperative. Enhancing participation of women in the workforce has, you know, enhances your GDP, productivity, efficiency, so on and so forth. So here, how do you think we can move ahead? How do we take forward the rhetoric and actually convert it into implementation. Thank you very much. First of all, let me um, thank the organizers for inviting me to this very, very important meeting. T20s are always important. Uh, T20 India is particularly important, I think, because it is having a special flavor of its own, adding and raising the voice of the, of the South. And I also like very much the enthusiasm, the self-criticism, uh, the sarcasm uh, what we're, that we've seen in all the sessions, but we're starting with this one. And let me, um, before answering your question, very, very quickly, in, in 30 seconds, tell you about another feature of the messed world that we are living in. And it will, the example will tell you a lot in itself. Um, of course, given the Russia-Ukraine war, um, no one discusses at all um, the, the horrors associated with, associated with it, the humanitarian part, etc., etc. But there's something very strange that's happening. Egyptians, uh, all, all countries in the world, people, when they travel to the U.S. to get their visa, they have to have vaccination. And in the past, the Russian vaccination was accepted for the visa. After the war, the Russian vaccination is no longer accepted. And this says a lot, really, about the vaccination and about what's, what's happening, how, how politicized the system is. So it's, 
It's really, I mean, I remember this when you were talking about all those jokes, but anyways. Um, let me talk about women, okay? Everybody is talking about women-led development, the importance of involving women. In, in some of our calculations in Egypt, we found that if we actually push women to the job market and to earn income, this is going to increase our rate of growth of the economy in the next 10 years by over 30%, just by getting them back. They are educated, but they are not involved enough in the, in the, in the job market. Um, the rhetoric messages are being repeated by everyone. The question is how to do it. The how question is never addressed fully. And I think the how question is best addressed by looking at specific success stories, particularly in the South, okay, at the micro level, at the community level, uh, that can be actually scaled up and replicated in, in other countries. And here G20 can play a role. I could mention that at the end. But let me give you some um, specific uh, examples and also coming actually from Egypt. We did um, in my center a very interesting study asking women why they're not terribly involved in the entrepreneurial uh, um, efforts and starting a business. I'm not talking about being employed in an organization or in a company. I'm talking about actually starting a business. And the answers uh, showed things that are very interesting, and I'm sure they apply to all other countries. One, women do not have enough information about the opportunities and about how to do things. They get, particularly if they're in the rural areas, they get the information from their fathers, from their brothers, their husbands, who are not particularly keen on making them business people. Let's, let's be very clear about that. So they don't have the information. Uh, this is one. Two, we found that the women who had exposure, the ones who lived in the cities, the ones who traveled, the ones who have seen success stories, doing a lot better and pushing things uh, uh, um, pushing things forward. And to, to try and get over that, we produced a guide uh, for women, very interesting, which is starting with a psychometric test, when women actually test themselves by answering certain questions and calculating the score to know how fit they are for starting a business. Because when you ask someone, you say, do you want to start a business? You say, yes, of course. But when you actually uh, uh, know the type of, of responsibilities and risks, you change your mind. So psychometric test, information about uh, MSMEs and the differences between them, and by the way, M should be left on its own, SMEs on the other side, they're, they're completely different. Presentation of all the regulations that exist in Egypt, all the steps, the procedures that they have to go through in order to start a business. And we actually pushed it and passed it on to the different organizations and it became very useful. Another example is a, a, a project that we called Your Job Next to Your Home, Okay, and this was actually very interesting, and it was initiated by an NGO, actually, getting big exporters uh, in the country to collaborate with the government. The government in the, in the specific governorates would build small factories as per the specifications of the exporter, as per the standards by the buyers in the Western countries. These factories are rented to young people from the villages. The factories are built in the villages, okay? And uh, the big exporter is, is buys their products for the next three years. And this is the collateral for the loan they get from the bank. So they don't have any money, but they get a loan from the bank to buy the equipment, which is theirs, out of this, out of this arrangement. And it works uh, beautifully. And the nice thing about it, that most of the employees if not all, were women because it was a ready-made garment industry, which is a, a female employer, and many of the managers of the companies also were, uh, were women. And the fact that they are close to their homes made it very easy for them, for them to work. The same model applies for exporting companies that work with the informal sector, people at their homes, the producing things, and they are the ones that take it and marketing. Those models are actually uh, practical. <clears throat> models that exist in, in, in countries and can be scaled up. And of course, the skill, uh, uh, improving the skills of women and the digital education is, 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 uh, is essential. Um, how can G20 benefit from this? And this was going to be your question, so I'm answering it uh, uh, in advance. Um, see that the link between the micro and the macro needs to be there. This is happening inside the countries, certain different attempts, okay? The G20 need to encourage the multilateral organizations and the governments of countries to increase, scale up 
those successful uh, uh, attempts. Everything that goes for growing out of poverty, not just supporting women and children by giving aid money, but helping them grow out of poverty. Okay? So the governments, the countries that apply that are the ones that would get a, a, a better treatment even in debt relief. I mean, you take it to the macro level in all types of arrangements uh, with them. I think this is how the G20 can, can help put the guidelines for the importance of growing out of poverty and for building up on what's happening in the communities because there are great things that are happening in the communities all over the place. And the ones, the governments that help and support and scale up these would get advantages, at least in dealing with the multinational organizations. Excellent. So um, we do have to keep some time for questions, but I have one final question for the panel, and perhaps you could integrate that in your responses to the questions that we get from the floor. Uh, and my question is the following. Uh, given that four consecutive G20 presidencies are being held by developing and emerging markets, what are the issues, in your view, we should take forward in this conversation so we can shape the narrative and bring to the fore the unique set of macroeconomic and development challenges that the global south faces? So be it issues of you know, poverty and inequality, uh, the fact that inflation imposes disproportionate burden on the poor, dis, uh, de debt sustainability issues which limit the fiscal space of the global south to invest in their development challenges or the climate challenge, uh, issues of informality in the labor market, what would be your top two issues? Uh, and I'll now turn to the floor and you can respond to my question when you are. Uh, I'm Sanjay, I'm from Manipal Academy of Higher Education. My question is to Madam Vira. Uh, is the plurilateral trade agreements is a viable option uh, to address the needs of the developing countries? Ashima Goel from IGIDR. My question is, I think, to Kim, since you were talking on the macro aspects. So uh, I think we need to recognize that now, since emerging and developing markets account for a major share of global growth, there is a feedback, a spillover from these countries to advanced economies, and they do take that into account, because even if they're concerned only with their own inflation and growth, you know, so that, that should moderate their macroeconomic policy. The second is, I think, as the, the world, we need to recognize what we have learned from these repeated crises. And in India, we saw that there was overreaction, overstimulus after the global financial crisis. And this was in many countries. After that, there was over tightening and huge fluctuations because of global risk on, risk off. And similarly, we are seeing this today in advanced economies. It is overstimulus after the pandemic. And then as a consequence, inflation and over tightening now. So we need to note this, that countries should not, uh, you know, take extreme steps, even if it's a pandemic or whatever, because that creates spillovers for other countries. And second, the combination of macro and fiscal. If there is too much fiscal stimulus, or if there is more fiscal tightening, fiscal stimulus tends to spread to other countries. Fiscal tightening has less effect on other countries compared to monetary tightening, because monetary tightening creates spillovers in financial markets. So the combination of monetary and fiscal policy. I think G20 should try to capture this learning and communicate it. Thank you. Another one? The last? Nagesh Kumar from ISID, India. Uh, my question is to Vera also. Uh, you know, you referred to new in rise of industrial policy, the new industrial policy and all that. Now, my mind went back to the earlier times when industrial policy was followed by many countries around the world. At that time, there were certain tools of industrial policy which were huge, like local content requirements, a whole host of performance requirements, which were outlawed or we lost the policy space to pursue them in, uh, in some of the WTO agreements, uh, trims for one. And so you think with the rise of industrial policy in the you know, biggest champions of uh, free markets, uh, creates a possibility of retrieving those policy spaces back, and if G20 can do something about it. Thank uh, you. To the plurilaterals, it's the only way to, 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 go, to go, but you know there's a problem. Some big countries, developing countries, are not agreeing to accept 
the plurilaterals inside the framework of WTO. Some developing countries. Uh, not to mention, India is one. Let's see what's going on that is for, for some special issues. Look, again, uh, local content is here, is there. Mr. Trump introduced it in automobiles. The European Union uh, became furious, and now they, they have a, 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 a dual agreement. And what's going on on subsidies? One trillion for the United States, 400 billion for the European Union, and uh, for Japan, something the numbers is, uh, is awful. It's uh, uh, also the same. So what's going on is, is a revival of the, all the, 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 the old uh, industrial policy that lived in the, 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 the past. On the what's, what's going on, on again, on the, the, the what's to say to the detente? Look, with all this mess in the area of standards, how the European Union can impose CBAN? How the European Union can say to you, your steel is not proper to get into Europe if it's not considering the, the source of energy that you are using? Come on, Brazil use uh, water. Other countries use coal. Without scope one, two, three, come on. This is an impossible way to do. And how to get the, the, the point of the G20 is, I love the declaration of G7. And there is a phrase new for me. That is, that is, we, president and first ministers, we task our ministers to do such and such. Can you imagine if you have in G20, the G20 saying, we task your, your officials, our bureaucrats, and to do what, to do what, to do a, a, an exercise of equivalence. You accept the standard that can be uh, real and uh, uh, contingent on the developing countries and developed countries. And then you can accept to create a rule. Without this, you are not, we are going to, to discuss on what? Different things, we're talking about different things. Again, deforestation, I agree, Brazil is the one that is really saying you are destroying the world because you're destroying the Amazon. My question is yes, you are changing a lot on this. My point is, who is buying our rare wood? That's the point. You are destroying because somebody is buying it. About Gold, do you know what's going on in Amazon? They are destroying a lot of things because of illegal gold uh, mining. The question is, go to the numbers again, all to the numbers, all the time to the numbers. Do you know the biggest importer of gold? Not uh, treasury gold, not monetary gold. I will tell you, UK. Tell me, explain me, you developed countries, who is buying? I'm not saying the second, uh, uh, the second country that's buying the gold of Brazil. Who is certifying it? That's the point. What are the rules for certification? Without this, you are not going to, 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 to reach uh, any constructive uh, end on the story of climate change. Dr. Kim, on the question of synchronization. Right. Yes, uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you for the question. And also, uh, first of all, uh, let me briefly answer to your question about the, uh, the global What's the role of the G20 of the uh, Global South? I think that the sustainability impact assessment is now implemented, conducted uh, in the EU level, uh, when we have a trade liberalization or trade integration. And then, so I think that this kind of the, the sustainability impact assessment uh, must be widely spread and expanded uh, in G20 level. But the G20 uh, does not have uh, that kind of the professional in, uh, uh, institutions. So I think that the other institutions can help or can report uh, to the G20 uh, on this uh, kind of things. And uh, to your questions, actually, I don't like the synchronization of the economic policy. No, never, uh, country by country. Because it, in, many cases, in many cases, that kind of the synchronization uh, would expand the uh, more volatility, leads to the more volatility of the, or instability. But because of the, the, the after the pandemic, the, the characteristics of pandemic leads to the, uh, the synchronization of the economic condition, the economic condition in each country. So that's the reason why we are talking about the monetary synchronization in this, I mean, the uh, communique and recommendations. Uh, but um, when you're uh, thinking about the, the, the fiscal policy and the monetary policy of each country after the pandemic, then uh, more uh, emphasis on the, the monetary policy of the synchronization. Uh, but uh, in terms of fiscal policy, 
It's, it differs country by country very much because of the, uh, the fiscal condition of the each, each government. I think that that is a very important point for the, uh, the, uh, how to harmonize the, harmonize, not synchronization, but the harmonization of the macroeconomic policy. Uh, need to think about the, uh, the synchronization of the economic policies, not the, uh, the cure method for the, the recover the, this kind of things. We need to think about the, uh, the, the side effect and adverse effect of the synchronization of the economic policy country by country. Uh, Dr. Damori. Okay. Yeah, uh, th there's no question for me, but uh, I think... My, my final question. Yeah, all right, uh, your uh, final questions. I, I, I think there are a lot of uh, things that the G20 can also uh, provide. Well, first one, so, uh, so uh, of course, I should underline uh, my my uh, previous remark that uh, the, the uh, realizations of the tit for tat uh, protectionisms uh, and protectionist actions are not really are not productive and are detrimental. So uh, actually, it is uh, the G20 need to uh, to realize it, uh, and also on the industrial policy, for example, uh, G20 can come up with some kind of uh, guidelines for the new industrial policy. It's more subtle. It, it it's not un, it's not really addressed under the WTO, but maybe. Uh, so maybe G20 can take initiative for that kind of guideline to separate the one that works. Uh, some some industrial policy are also good. Uh, uh, the, uh, so we have to separate the one that works for global economy and the one that uh, are uh, uh, negatively affect the global economy. Um, uh, uh, that kind of things uh, might also help. And of course, uh, the other things uh, that I always repeat again and again, accelerate the WTO reform process. Well, that's the key the, the, for multilateral trading systems uh, to work uh, uh, against. But one thing on the uh, Professor Goyal uh, questions, I think G20 missed the opportunity of having synchronization last year. Yeah, because it was uh, it was a critical time for uh, monetary and uh, fiscal policy synchronizations after we uh, exit from the uh, from the uh, pandemic. Uh, but now it, it's better uh, late than never. Uh, although uh, the the burden is becoming harder uh, to uh, make the synchronizations uh, work, but of course the benefit is even higher at the moment. Thank you. Yes, um, I think the questions have been addressed. Let me say but the important messages that I think are essential to be said. Um, I think that uh, G20 needs to start a process uh, of um, avoiding dealing with the symptoms and dealing with the core problems for a change. Everything we are, everything we are dealing with the symptoms. Okay, by the way, including even the standardization. It's a symptom of a bigger problem. The only reason we're talking about the minerals is because China is putting restrictions on the exports of minerals. Otherwise, we wouldn't talk about it. The, 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 the trade system internationally is messed up. One of the key issues is the fact that WTO has a, a dispute settlement system that's not working because the US is actually blocking the appointment uh, uh, there. Okay, yes. Yes, so yes, so I mean, it, these are all symptoms. The core problem is that the South is not visible, not only as a voice, but as members in the UN, in the World Bank, in the IMF. They are not there. The Bretton Woods Agreement needs to be changed. It does not fit anymore. It was done at a time after the Second World War with a certain division of power in the world that is not there anymore. It needs to be changed and respect the new situation, the world, the, the earth is not going to open and swallow Russia and China and then the rest will live happily ever after, okay? It's not going to happen, okay? We have to live with each other and we have to do that fast because what we're trying to do is fit the elephant that's in the picture here in a very small box. We have a system that's not working. The BRICS got created because the G20 is not addressing their needs. The G7 are looking at themselves. Yes, giving instructions to ministers to do uh, whatever is not going to solve the problem. It's again dealing with the symptoms. We need to look now at where we can go. We need to put scenarios and do cost-benefit analysis for them and understand because what we're doing is put rhetorics and say we need to change without talking about how to do the change. And if we keep things this way, think something, a weird animal is going to de develop and we might not be able to deal with it and it will be very ugly. We need to do something about that.
Those but are again, the destroying the, 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 the international organizations not to go into to solve anything. You have to transform them. Yes. That's the point. Don't crash. That's, that, that put them said, you have to change. Yeah. Do it and not uh, uh, the entire away. system, but the political willingness to change the system has to be there. It is not there yet. There is rhetoric, which is the beginning, but the, the, the actual political will is not there. Do you know when the system will change? When we have another war. That's it. Go to the history and discover that the system will change you have only when you have but, a terrible But then you crash. actually have a war. During wars, this is the time Awful. for change. Yes, I, I think and that's... And it's not happening. We're, we're completely out of time, but that's a very appropriate note to conclude because it's striking that most of the conversation in this group has been driven by geopolitical factors. And when we talk about the solutions, again, what's the how, how is that going to happen? It's being constrained by geopolitical factors. So that's a very appropriate note. To, so it's the geopolitics, which is driving the macroeconomics. And on that note, we're completely out of time. So thank you so much for a lively discussion.